Hey everyone and welcome to another video. I am Simply G and today I'm going to be talking about all of the manga that I picked up for this month of October. Um, I thought I wouldn't have a lot of books this month mainly because I hadn't actually pre-ordered a lot for this month. Um, I had a couple titles that I pre-ordered but the rest uh, I just I I had kind of low priority for buying books this this month but but so this month I finally finally went to go see check out um, a local comics book comic books and like pop culture store nearest to my area it's about 20 25 minutes away um, just to see their manga uh, section they they mainly focus on graphic novels and and comics but they do have you know manga and other nerdy things in in their store and I wanted to see what it was like because I'd never been there I'd, I'd driven past quite a few times um, it's hard to miss because it's a bright purple building with green signage uh, but I popped in and was pleasant really pleasantly surprised at their range of stuff because not only was there a lot of titles that I was following um, from a whole wide variety of publishers, not just the standard Viz stuff that you get used to seeing in actual bookstores here, but there was also just stuff that I was in, like, hadn't expected there. Um, as I said, it was more than just the standard Viz or even like Kodansha or Yen Press titles, action, shonen, uh, stuff. There was everything. L whole, whole, I, it wasn't a huge section, but they had new, new releases. Stuff that are not out in other stores yet here. Which they've obviously... I don't know where their suppliers come from. I expect from the US. But um, other stores, one, either don't supply these books. Or two, won't supply them for several more months. So I definitely like, got too excited and bought a lot of books from them. And I'm hoping to do that, uh, hopefully not so many books necessarily, um, but I'm, I am hoping to buy more of my books that I'm wanting from them because I do, it's more expensive, but I do want to support a local family run business versus an online bookstore that is run by Amazon um, because I, I, I don't want to support Amazon. But unfortunately, like a lot of people in Australia, I think there's very few options to buy from independent booksellers. And so the fact that I was able to find uh, such a cool place really close to me meant that um, my, my buying habits hopefully will change for the better. I don't think I will be able to completely cut like Amazon and such out of my diet as of right now, but considering the amount of stuff and the variety of stuff that I got from them this month, I am super duper, super duper excited for the future. But I'm going to get straight into it because there's quite a few books here to talk about and a lot of exciting things to talk about, so I'll get straight into it and I hope you guys enjoy. So first off is a book that was actually a Kickstarter reward. Um, the Kickstarter wasn't actually for printing this book. It, it was it or it is um, a Kickstarter for producing a documentary about mangaka and creating manga within Japan. But one of the reward tiers included the English publication of an anthology of stories by Ryoko Iwabuchi uh, called Cicada Man. So this is from the... Uh, yeah, here we go. So with this, you can see it's a pretty skinny book. It is completely in English, um, and I, but I will talk about it in just a second. It came with a postcard, obviously, also done by Iwabuchi. So Mangaka... A sketch life of a sketch of life in Tokyo is the actual um, documentary that they kickstarted uh, successfully, and then uh, this is more of Ibuchi's art, and more specifically for Cicada Man. So this is a collection of short stories, uh, very much focused on beauty, 
and sort of the fleetness of beauty and also kind of uh, beauty and death and sort of how those two things interconnect. Um, none of the stories have any sort of crossover, but the theming of it is very, very uh, similar. So we have the titular comic about a very ugly man, a gardener, who soon changes, uh, yeah, like, I don't know, something about cicadas are, em male cicadas are empty inside and that's how they can sing so beautifully. Um, yeah, it's, it's a curious, interesting, interesting one. Uh, the following is Children of Goodbye, which plays a lot with gender and, um, androgyny and the ideas of, like, genderless angels. Um, it's, it's probably the most odd within the book. I will say that this one has, um, you don't, it's not explicitly seen, but it does mention and contain underage sex, so... I mean, underage in so far as, like, teenagers. Um, so I don't know if you'll be able to buy this book outside of the Kickstarter, but if you are wanting it and if you can track it down and that is something you're uncomfortable with, just be aware. You don't see anything, but it is, like, it. it's directly referencing pregnancy as something that these, yeah, underage sex and underage pregnancy, so... Yes, anyway, the wind, the wind shine is pretty, uh, it's about a hairdresser who's kind of in love with one of her clients and, uh, things go a little bit unexpected. Uh, Beautiful Boy's Bone is White, I think it was, uh, this mangaka's debut and is about a beautiful boy, a pretty boy, Bishonen, um, who... All of these girls have just, like, a psychotic love for him. He dies, unexpectedly, and then, uh, it's about their just obsessiveness, and, again, like, the the beautiful and the young die early, like, that whole sentiment. The good die young. Um, there's direct reference or, uh, comparison with characters like Gilbert, um, from, uh, the, the wind, the trees, the, what, the, I can't remember the, I can never remember the full title of that. And also, and also Ash Lynx from Banana Fish. Um, so yeah, it has that kind of feeling to it. The wolf is, uh, kind of a strange werewolf story. And then, um, this one is the tattoo uh, again, it's pretty straightforward, boys, tattoos, and then at the end we have a gallery with a lot of very beautiful pictures. Um, if nothing else, Iwabuchi has a gorgeous art style, which I'm sure you've been looking at this whole time. Um, yeah, interesting little book. Uh, it also has an interview at the back, done by Alan Kepsky. I think, I believe that's, that's the pronunciation of that last name. Who was also the editor and sort of the organizer for this particular little book. Um, so this is very obviously not a professionally published book, uh, I'd say. Um, it's not, it, it feels like a Kickstarter book and that might be even a little mean to say about Kickstarter books because the translation on this is quite clunky. And the editing is, there, I don't want to say there was no editing, because there was very obviously editing, but I don't know if they were, everyone on the team was English speakers, namely because there's some understandable spelling mistakes in here. Um, and things like that nature. It doesn't feel like a professionally released book, which it isn't. Like, it's a self-published book that isn't even the main reward for what this Kickstarter was meant to be, so perhaps the expectation isn't, shouldn't be that high for it. I, I would hope that it would be high, but, like, they are 
it feels like an amateurly published book, which it is. Um, again, I don't know if you will be able to get this book outside of the Kickstarter, if you'd be able to buy it. Um, I think it was a limited thing for just this, <laughs> the backers who were wanting it. But yeah, so I can't, like, I... I don't know. I don't know um, whether or not we'll see more of this ilk or more from this particular creator in English again. But it, it's it's not like I liked it. It's a it's an interesting mix of stories, and Ibuchi has a lot that I think she likes to explore in her series. Um, so I do hope that if she ever does kind of make a longer form manga, we might see it in the future in English or she continue to self-publish or publish into English via this sort of crowdfunding sources um so yeah Cicada Man little bit of a oddity <laughs> um but but something I was happily surprised like happily surprised with receiving because I hadn't expected to get it um, so soon or this quickly. So yeah. So next is the most recent and final volume of Hiroma Arakawa Silver Spoon, volume 15. This follows, this is a comedy kind of slice of life, uh, coming of age drama about a teenage boy called Hotchkin who joins an agricultural high school in order to kind of find his path in life. He doesn't really have any interest or uh, background in agriculture, but he just is kind of trying to get to a school the farthest away from his parents and their expectations and find out who he is and what he wants to be and how he wants to live his life. And in joining the school, he becomes a lot more aware of um, the agricultural industry. His classmates typically come from an agricultural background and the various issues, the various um, things, strains on the agricultural industry, uh, not only in Japan, but around the world that do impact the families who have been farming for generations and how the younger generation is adapting to the new technologies, the new sciences, the new ways that agriculture is adapting to, to our modern world. It's phenomenal. It's amazing. I adore this series so, so much. Hiroma Arakawa, um, for those who aren't aware, is the mangaka of Fullmetal Alchemist. Um, most definitely her most popular work. This, as I've said before, is by far like her magnum opus though. Uh, I I really feel like this is the story that she wants to tell, wanted to tell. That it was something that was a lot more close, uh, a lot more personal to her life and to uh, what she cares about. And it's also really, it's so funny. It is so funny. I laugh a hundred times a hundred times it's it's <laughs> she's so funny um yeah i don't want to and open the end of the book but i did just because i don't want to spoil people for the ending if you are currently reading it this particular book focuses a lot on graduation coming to the end of their high school career and making decisions for their future and how their lives um are changing and where they want to go from here, how the things they've learned in school have shaped their their decisions for a career. It is really good. I I love it. I love it a lot. Um, yeah, I highly encourage you to read this series if you have not yet. Now that it is complete, hopefully more people will try it. And it's not super duper long. Um, it's obviously very different from Full Metal Alchemist, but it is also very obviously a Hiromu Arakawa series. Um, it, it has her signature style of writing, style of humor, a uh, sense of humor, and uh, all of her characters are all just really well-rounded. They feel like people um, with all of their faults, 
and flaws and, you know, good points. It's really, 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 really wonderful. And I'm sad to see it finished, um, but I do hope that it means that one day we may get a new original work from Arakawa. She is still working on Heroic Legend of Arslan, which is an adaptation. Um, she isn't necessarily writing the story for that. There is a novel that that is based off of. Um, but if this if this and Full Metal are the only like truly original works of hers that we see, I mean that what a, what an amazing amazing career that would be. Um, but I, I look forward to if she has anything else planned in the future um, that are her own ideas, that are things that um, aren't just adaptations of other people's work. Next is Volume 2 of Perfect World by Rie Aruga. This is an ongoing... I think it's just finishing. I think Volume 12 is the last um, in Japan. I... Jose romance following uh, two two people who were high school um, friends, classmates, kind um, not really friends. They didn't really know each other. Um, they knew each other in passing, but who the girl always had feelings for the guy who was sort of the captain of the basketball team, star player, um, and they reconnect ten years later at their high school reunion. And uh, she discovers that this boy that she has had feelings for had a, a pretty serious accident and a spinal injury, um, which resulted in a spinal injury. So now he is in a wheelchair. And that has very obviously shaped his life since. Um, it's about their romance, their relationship, and the various real-world struggles that um, face disabled pe physically disabled people especially within the world how that can impact a relationship um in ways that you don't even necessarily expect uh when you get into that relationship and how society treats and responds to the disabled and and those who uh, you know, need need other other sorts of accessibility in their life compared to fully able-bodied people it's really really good um i love this series i've read 10 of the the 11 um volumes that are available the 12th i don't think as i said the 12th is the ending i don't think the series is actually finished yet i think there's two or three more chapters and um, it will be published in Japan at some point, and in English at some point, obviously. Um, but I, this was a series that I was following digitally for a long time. Really, really happy that we have gotten it in print because it is one that I think a lot of people would enjoy. And I do like seeing not only such a healthy exploration of relationships, and relationships that featured um, disability and that handled disability in a very respectful and overall like nuanced way that doesn't hide away or kind of sugarcoat the the gross and gory details of and realities of of disability but it also doesn't like make them terrifying or disgusting or like horrific and and like the end of the world or it's the end of your life once you do uh do become disabled um it's yeah ooh 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 ooh, ooh. um i yeah i've spoken about the series a lot previously um on in videos and on disability in manga I think it's really nice that we're again also getting more Jose in print because obviously I'm I'm a fan of Jose and uh, Jose romance with like a pretty healthy and well-adjusted <laughs> couple is also really nice to see um, and and how the challenges 
um, that aren't present in a relationship when people are able-bodied are handled and discussed with maturity and and with a care with you know uh, an interest in a kindness that may otherwise like people don't think about otherwise that may um, get forgotten um, the disability is which I really appreciate in the series the disability is never treated as like just a gimmick um it's never treated as just like this is the be all end all because also we have multiple perspectives from multiple different disabled people so despite our main male character having quite um ups like uh upset feelings and and um, really negative feelings about his disability and how he came to be disabled um, and how it's impacted his life. He isn't the only voice we we hear and it's also not, so it's not given just like the blanket statement of like, yes, this is what all disabled people think and this, therefore, you know, this is the be all end all of having disability or having to use a wheelchair yeah, so, and also how how much it's become a part of his life and this discussion of accessibility in Japan in public spaces and otherwise in private spaces too. It is wonderful. Uh, definitely pick it up if it sounds like something you are interested in. And uh, yeah, I I I can't wait until we have. We have all of it, and it will look so beautiful on, on the shelf. Next is the first perfect edition of Soul Eater by Atsushi Okubo. Uh, this is another one that I talked a little bit in a wrap-up video about, but so this is the first, I guess, Kanzenban uh, re-release edition. Um, by Square Enix of this very popular shonen action series. It has a very popular anime. Same mangaka as the currently popular, currently airing Fire Force, um, which I, I haven't read a huge amount of Fire Force. I think I read one or two volumes. I have up to like volume 15 digitally, so I should probably read more. Although that series... Oh, okay, so... <laughs> Soul Eater, I, I really dig Soul Eater. I like it a lot. It has a, a lot, a whole ton of issues. Um, some that are very, very, very obvious um, and that do impact my reading of it. Um, but but one, it's, it is it is sort of a nostalgic series for me. It's one of the first manga I was ever picking up. I used to own the Yen Press singles. It was one of the earlier anime that I was watching when I was first getting into the, the, <laughs> the medium. Um, and so there's a personal connection there but also I just think like it's a really cool premise I it has it's perfect for October because it's got a really spooky Halloween aesthetic to it and it's fun it's quirky all of the characters or at least all of the main characters are pretty interesting and well-rounded over the course of the series but my biggest gripe with this series and I think it's something that people have become more more aware of, especially with Fire Force, is the amount of fan service in excess, so much so that it impacts the overall flow uh, and of the story itself. So I said this in my wrap-up video, like, I, I don't actually dislike or hate fan service. I'm not a prude. I don't care if a series has fan service, if it's not like excessive obsessive or just like completely inappropriate um I I don't go out of my way to watch you know shows that are just etchy for the etchy but I don't care that much if you know you have a panty shot here or there if girls boobs jiggle or you know they wear 
possible outfits that suction cup to their their breasts like I don't care you have hot girls in your series that's fine like I don't it's fine but when it becomes so much the focus of a scene in an otherwise in a story that otherwise like is moving at a pretty fast pace or it has other alternate like storylines that it's following when you f when a series just stops to focus completely on fan service or the fan service character so much so that the entire story grinds to a complete halt is when I get like upset that there's fan service that it's it is actually impacting the flow of the reading or watching as well uh solid or the anime like it actually takes like tones down a lot of the fan service that show has fan service but it, it's it is not not nearly as bad as as the manga bad quote unquote um and i've seen a similar sentiment said to fire force which is kind of why i dropped it as well i was like oh there's a lot of fan service like early on and the premise to that's really interesting too like i i i think okbo has great great ideas great aesthetic choices as well i think there's a lot of really fun cool things that he does with his series um but man fan service is clunky uh so if you're not familiar with I know I got to be careful cuz this series this first volume has a bunch of fan service. So this series follows three groups of uh weaponmeister pairs. So it's set in a world where um certain individuals exist that uh are kind of the the physical embodiment of weapons and thus they can turn into weapons. Yeah, this first chapter, there's a lot of fan service. Yeah, Titty right there. Blair, this character is the, like, big fan service character. Blair and then Subaku, who we're talking about. Um, and so certain characters can, certain people can turn into weapons. Um, it's a genetic thing. And uh, in order to control their... Um, powers i guess they pair up with those who can control this weapon use this weapon called meisters and it's a a hope that you find a you have to find someone who like understands you who resonates with you on in your soul you need a soul resonance um to to be able to use this this weapon and each each weapon is trying to become a death scythe i.e a weapon that can be used by the literal grim reaper lord death himself who also just happens to be the principal of this school um so we follow we follow multiple groups of characters we have the titular soul leader um which is his name uh whose partner is maka and she she and soul are the main characters uh maka is the one on the cover here we also have black star and subaki uh one well soul is a big scythe like a big actual scythe uh subaki is a whole bunch of like different ninja weapons uh that she can turn into and her and black star is a like i think he comes from a ninja family um, and is incredibly powerful, incredibly strong, but is also super obnoxious and has to be the center of attention at all times. And thus, um, he, he cannot, he's just not good at his job. Uh, he, he doesn't, he can't hide out in the shadows like a ninja is actually supposed to. And thus, uh, he's kind of ruined every job he's been on. And then we, and so Maka's like a high achiever. She's top of the class. She and Sol are the most um, she, able to get the 99 human souls that they need to qualify to become a Death Scythe, which you eat a witch's soul. That's the whole thing. You get, collect 99 souls from humans and one witch soul. 
And at the beginning of the story, they've done that, but they screw up last minute, uh, which basically resets them to zero. Um, and then our third group is Death the Kid, who is the son of the Grim Reaper, uh, Lord Death himself, and his his twin gun partners, Pat and Liz, uh, or Patty and Liz, uh, who turn into identical revolvers and and uh death the kid is is just obsessive about symmetry so much so that it it impacts his like day-to-day life a huge amount um and thus means he he he's not nearly the cool like grim reaper character that he thinks he is um, and he's just very inflexible. <laughs> uh, but yeah, oh, like, I actually, I have such fond memories of Soul Eater, and when this manga is good, like, when it's doing everything right, when it's firing on all c- cylinders, it is great. Like, it is really, really good. All of the characters, like, you grow to love them so, so much over the course of the series. All of the main characters, I'd say. Um, has a really diverse cast. Um, a lot of these kids, because there's only one school that like teaches this weapon meister thing, um, and there's a real want to get into uh, becoming a meister um, or becoming a like a, a fully fledged death scythe weapon because it leads to very high leadership positions, very affluent jobs. Um, it's, it's basically like your ticket to success. Um, and, uh, so you learn more about these characters, their motivations, how they wound up here. Uh, they all come from different countries and again, different backgrounds. And it's, ooh, 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 ooh. And once you get more into, like, the witches aspect of it and the sort of various evil plots going on, it's it's super really wonderful and exciting and interesting. And I, I really, really like it. But then every so often, it'll have to have a chapter just focused on Blair or it'll have to have just really awkward like yeah really awkward hen- not hentai but really awkward etchy like softcore porn styles of fan service and you're like was that really necessary i don't think so like it just it doesn't add to the series it kind of subtracts the series when everything grinds to a halt and again that's my look take on it but it is something that i've seen people mirror the in sentiment not only with soul eater but with fire force as well as just like when it's good it's great when there's fan service it's unnecessary and it slows everything down and all of that could be cut out and you would lose nothing right um so yeah, I was kind of uh, seesawing on whether I wanted to pick up these editions of Soul Eater, mainly because I, you know, I've read the whole series. I used to own the singles. I sold them many years ago now, um, just because I was wanting, needing space, and I didn't think I'd read it again, or I just, you know, it wasn't it. I. I <laughs> It's hard because I do enjoy it so much, but then at the time especially, the bads kind of were very, very overtly, like, fresh in my mind. Um, and, you know, this was five years or so ago now. Um, but, but this book was at that local comic shop that I was talking about earlier, and it finally gave me that final push to pick these up. They are very lovely if you're buying the full metal editions of full metal alchemist they are in a very similar style same trim size hardcover um archival quality paper color pages um and a new updated um well i say spruced up i guess translation um which i i don't think there's been a huge amount of change just with this first 
volume, but I will be interested um, in subsequent volumes to see how they handle Corona's pronouns, because for those who aren't familiar, Corona um, is a character that in Japanese uses a genderless pronoun, um, which is the equal to like they, them in English. But when the manga and the anime was coming out originally in English, the they, them pronoun, singular pronouns weren't really as widely accepted in um, discussion, community, uh, identity, culture as it is now. Um, and so they used he for Krona because there was a whole argument. It's like, well, we didn't want to call Krona it. I'm like, there was other options. You didn't have to call Krona it. Um, but they chose he, him, and uh, I would, I'd be interested to see if that changes once that character shows up. Um, because I like Karna as well. I think they have a really interesting storyline. Very tragic storyline. But, but, yeah. Ooh, 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 ooh. I look forward to more of these books. And uh, they are really nice. If you're a fan of Solidar or if you're wanting to read it, um, and haven't checked out Solidar. If you don't mind, you know, fan service occupying your your reading experience every so often um, to the detriment of the overall story, or it doesn't really impact you, it's not a detriment in your eyes, uh, then check it out. Solidar is very unique, very fun. Um, it gets dark, like pretty pretty messed up at a lot of points and it is the perfect Halloween spooky October read to get into because it is set in this weird Halloween uh, style universe uh, mirroring our own. Um, you can watch all these these weird weird teens hang out in their strange unusual school in the middle of the Nevada desert and fight evil humans in order to eat their souls. <laughs> um, so yeah, so later. It's a pretty good fun time. Another completed series this month with the second half of Ping Pong Volume 2. Okay, I... This is by Tai Matsumoto. This is his... I think it's five volumes originally. Um, series about... Sports series about two childhood friends who are both talented at ping pong or table tennis um, who grew up playing together and because of that it sort of impacted how they play with each other. Now they're in high school they're on the tennis or uh, table tennis team or ping pong team um, and are finally kind of seriously competing with other people and how that's changed how they play, why they play, um, their personal motivations, and the various people around them who recognize their talents, recognize um, whether they work hard or whether it is just kind of coasting on pure talent. Uh, so we have Smile, who is a very serious, um, somewhat unemotional robot-like, is what they call him, a young guy who doesn't smile, therefore that's why they call him Smile, um, who is again very very good at table tennis, and and his friend Peko, who was the one who like introduced Smile to the game, who brought him to play with him, uh, who was also very talented, but he's much more of a wild card, much more of a free spirit, he's energetic and out there and um, very chatty, very personable, uh, almost to an annoying level, um, and, and his, his love of the game and how he reacts to Smile, um, doing so well in competition versus himself. And it's, it's, ooh, 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 ooh. I mean, sports series can kind of be a hard sell for a lot of people, um, because I think there's still, in some communities, the, the stigma that sports manga and sports, the sports genre isn't interesting. <laughs> um, or if you're not into sports, you're not going to enjoy them. I am the least athletic person in the world. 
I love sports manga <laughs> and sports anime. I can't watch sports live action stuff because it bores me to tears, but but comics, anime, I'm there for it, right? Um, I do watch, I mean, some sports uh, on TV and stuff, but I'm not the, the type to actually go out and play a team sport or even an individual sport <laughs> myself. Um, but time, I also knew, like, I've seen the anime adaptation of this. It's phenomenal. Highly recommend it. Uh, 11 episode series, complete adaptation of the books, the, uh, the, the manga, um, done by Masaki Yuasa, uh, who you may know from Devil of Man, Crybaby, and other various, various titles. But, oh, I adore Taya Matsumoto's works, um, and all of them are so different from each other in a lot of senses. Like, they're completely different genres, they're completely different characters and stories, but there's always this struggle of youth and kids finding their way, um, and finding their place. And he, oh, he's such a phenomenal artist. Look how well the movement is. Look how just, oh, oh, it's so dynamic. And there's just so much personality in Matsumoto's works. Um, we've gotten a lot of his stuff in English recently, uh, which is great because I love it. <laughs> um, I love that fact. We've recently gotten, um, just announced that number five is being relicensed by, or I guess reprinted, relicensed by Viz after their first attempt didn't do too well, um, which was many a year ago now, and I'm glad they're going back to reassessing uh, his titles and re releasing their titles. Um, we have quite a bit of his stuff available in English. Um, Ping Pong was sort of the notable exception for a long time, but obviously now, now we have it. Um, Black and White or Tech on Kingcrete is sort of his most notable work that also has an anime adaptation, film adaptation, um, which is wonderful. Uh, and that has a big, l very large trim, um, two-in-one. Is that a two-in-one series or a three-in-one? I can't quite remember, but a complete series, single volume book release. Uh, we also have Cats of the Louvre, released by him, Sunny, which is a six-volume release, hardcover. Um, that one's set in the 70s with a orphan orphanage or like a, a child care house. Um, and then also Go Go Monster. And uh, I feel like I'm forgetting one. I can't remember. But I, oh, Blue Spring, which is like an old, old, old uh, short story collection that, again, was when Viz was sort of just dipping their toe into this creator and his works. Um, but I'm really happy to see his stuff being made available, and I think more people buying it, enjoying it, recognizing uh, him and his work. All of his uh, all of his series also have, like, I think there's a perception that his artwork is bad, which I will argue with you endlessly over because no, <laughs> he's an incredibly accomplished artist. And just because the character design or the art style isn't the same as generic, you know, shonen manga 473, doesn't mean that it's bad. I've, you know me, I, I will argue art style versus art skill till the cows come home. Um, but, but what's so notable about Masumoto and his work is that all, each of his titles, like, has, he's adapted his artwork to suit the story that he's telling in that book. Comparatively to, like, earlier, I was talking about Silver Spoon. Pearl Arakawa's art style doesn't change between Full Metal Alchemist and Silver Spoon. You can tell that both of those titles are hers. Um, similarly, Soul Eater, I mean, the first, the first several volumes are rough. Like, it's an early work, but 
throughout the, the overall consistency of the art style in that series and then Fire Force's current series, you can tell it's the same creator. And that typically is the case when you're talking about mangaka because, or when you're talking about artists because they, have, they develop a style and they stick to it because that's what they enjoy, that's what works for them, and that's what their fans like as well. Masumoto, he is always very obviously his style, but there are subtle and sometimes very large changes between each work that makes the art in each series suit the feel, the atmosphere, the mood of what that story is about and how those characters feel and what needs to be focused on for those characters. It is, it is so good. I highly recommend everyone try Tai Matsumoto's work, especially Ping Pong. Um, if you're not wanting to buy the manga, stream the anime. It's not a hugely long series and the art style is captured perfectly thanks to Yuasa's also kind of unconventional art direction, character design direction that he has in his series. Um, but yeah, Ping Pong fantastic and uh, be sure to check it out. Speaking of creators with unconventional art styles, <laughs> next we have volume 6 of Mob Psycho 100 by 1. This is the most recent volume put out by Dark Horse of this coming of age comedy about a kid with ESP psychic powers who, uh, you know, just trying to live his life. Uh, unfortunately, he keeps getting dragged into problems because other people are like, hey, you have ESP powers. We want to um, exploit you. <laughs> or you could be amazing. You could take over the world. And he's like, but I don't, I don't really want to do that, though. I just kind of want to live my life maybe get a girlfriend and, uh, you know, be happy and normal. And, uh, it's, it's fabulous. It is so, so good. Um, I know, I would say that probably people agree with me, uh, now, <laughs> especially since the anime adaptation. And I'm not saying that, like, I'm, I also wasn't going into this series blind. I, I watched the anime adaptation first, um, and it is one that it's kind of a little bit of a slow burn early on. It takes a couple episodes to figure out what the series is quite doing, but one is exceptional at being funny, but also having like such a heartfelt, true message of growing up and finding yourself in this series. Um, I don't dislike One Punch Man. It's been a long time since I've read it, and it's been a l even longer time since I was watching it. Um, I've only seen the first season. I know people dislike the second season because of studio changes. Um, but One Punch Man will always feel like it doesn't quite hit the heights, the narrative heights of Mob Psycho 100, mainly because the larger joke, the larger theming around the joke seems to consistently, I don't know, push. Because the whole point is like, in One Punch Man, the whole point is like anyone can become a hero if you work hard. Um, and then sometimes, you know, when you reach your goals, you do, you know, you're, you're so powerful. Like you, you succeed so much that it becomes blasé. It becomes the norm and it's not exciting or interesting anymore. And it's up to you to like keep that momentum going. Right. Um, or at least from what I remember of the first 10 volumes. Um, and it's, you know, it's funny, like, oh yes, you know, he's so powerful and he wins every fight with one punch and yada yada. But the joke kind of, that's always the punchline, right? Is he's so powerful, no matter how powerful the, the villain is, ultimately one punch will, will end it and 
you know, life will go for Saitama things. He's like gets really hyped that maybe he's finally found a villain who will take some like a some actual effort to beat, but no, he's just has to go back to his bored life and uh maybe maybe physical power isn't isn't you know the most important thing after all or what what does the strongest person in a fight do when fighting becomes boring because you are the strongest person in the fight like that's the whole theming the whole messaging um the whole premise of of one punch man and it's like it has its funny moments it has its funny characters um i will say and i've said this since day one that i do think that the art style change in the manga version versus the web novel um or web comic sorry uh is to the detriment of the series because mob psycho has one doing the art and you saw like it's not <laughs> character design wise it's it's simple it's again quote unquote bad art but it is so much more effective, so much more effective with its emotional parts, with its comedy, with its everything, than I think a more generic art style would have been. One is a good artist. People have tried to tell me that he's not, but he's a, or they're a good artist. <laughs> um, yeah. I don't think you could do the things that are attempted and successfully pulled off in Mob Psycho if you didn't understand how art works, how art can be used for comedy, and how effective comedic timing is through art, right? Um, so yeah, Mob Psycho 100 Volume 6, this is a 16 volume series. Um, completed in Japan, so we're we're slowly getting there. Um, I I always am excited when Dark Horse puts out one of these volumes because it just shows that they do actually care about the manga that they're, that they're putting out to some extent. Um, and if all of these deluxe like Berserk editions and whatever they're putting out gives them enough money to keep them licensing stuff that that I am enjoying, then more power to them. Keep re-releasing -re various editions of Berserk and Blade of the Immortal to your heart's content, and I will keep buying Mob Psycho and all their other weird little quirky titles <laughs> that are um, less of household names and less uh, heavy hitters within the industry. So next is another like weird, quirky, unusual... Um, perhaps unexpected volume uh, for me uh, in which, I don't know, people who've been around a long time should know that I, I read a lot of weird stuff. Um, and I've actually read this creator's previous work and enjoyed it. Like, I did like it a lot, um, which is kind of a very divisive, <laughs> very divisive series. But this one is his more popular work, um, and I I follow it week to week on the Shonen Jump app. This is volume one of Chainsaw Man by Tatsuki Fujimoto. This follows uh, a teenage boy called Denji who, um, when sort of at the beginning of the series, he has a dog devil who is also like, you can see he's part dog, part chainsaw. Um, and okay, this is a, like a very violent, very gory manga. I do want to uh, preface my ex my explanation and my flipping through with that but it follows uh his character and he's an orphan he doesn't have any education nobody's ever cared about him um and he he lives in this world where devils are quite common they impact and ruin people's lives very regularly and there's a security force called devil hunters um who you know, hunt devils and kill them and to stop them from doing bad stuff, right? Um, but so one day, uh, Denji is attacked and killed, violently killed by the people who are kind of ordering him around. 
and uh, he, his dog, uh, Pochita, this this chainsaw dog, um, makes a pact with him um, and give, gives him the second chance of life as the devil himself, and he becomes the titular chainsaw man. As you can see, he has a chainsaw head and arms and all these things, and uh, so throughout the story, uh, or in the story later, he joins the security force, he's given the opportunity to live a normal life, which was his one dream, um, live a normal life and like touch a boob, which seems pretty on brand for a 15 year old. <laughs> um, and and so he joins the security force and uh kind of gets exposed to just the horrors of devils and um trying to fight the gun devil which or the gun or the bomb devil gun devil um which has just destroyed entire populations and there's a lot of like mystery and questioning as to who is really the bad guys here and what are devils and why are they around and um, yeah, it's, it's, I, I follow this, as I said, I follow this week to week. Um, I really enjoy it a lot. It is, has been said, and I would agree that it's one of the best things in Jump right now. Um, it's really interesting, very unusual to what I think most people think of as like a Shonen Jump title. Um, it is less in your face with just obscene shock, uh, shock value of, um, his previous work, which was, um, Fire Punch, which as I said, I have read and I did like, like I enjoyed it. Um, but that series is very divisive. It has a lot of just like horrific stuff, straight up, um, cannibalism, incest, vi violence, so much violence against the weak and the elderly and children, sexual violence, um, there's, there's a, ooh, it's not a good time, but, and I do think that it's kind of a shame that a lot of people only think of Fujimoto's stuff as a vehicle for shock value and that the series his series rely so much on like grossing out and pushing boundaries and making readers uncomfortable and exploring these darker elements of humanity i th i think that it is i do think that it's not fair to just label uh even fire punch as that um, but especially Chainsaw Man. Like, uh, there is a, a real narrative and really important messages. And I think both both of those series are really powerful at what they do if you give it a chance and if you're not, like, just overtly too weirded out and, and like, squicked out. That's old, old internet language. Squicked out. Uh, with all of this just like obscenely <laughs> over the top just disgusting stuff that happens um if you give it the chance or if you, you're not put off by that there's it there's some really wonderful stuff <laughs> in both fire punch and chainsaw man and the larger messaging is is very clear and also like Something that Fujimoto is really good at, his, his manga feel so much like this could be adapted to the screen very easily. Like, they feel like watching a movie, if that makes sense. Um, they feel cinematic in a way that is different, like, it's... There are some mangaka that, that are able to do that very well, but more so than even those who who have a more cinematic feel to their manga, Fujimoto really, you can see his love for movies in his manga, and it really, it really gives another dimension to your, your reading. Yeah, I, 
I really, really enjoyed Chainsaw Man. I also, as I said, if you... It, Chainsaw Man is the more tame of those two titles, but that's not saying a huge amount. Um, and if you're put off by, like, Denji just caring about wanting to touch boobs for, like, the first 10-ish, 10, 10-15 chapters, um, you know, don't... Like, I... I think it's unfair. He gets... Yeah. And that's not what the story is. It's not fan servicey. It's not that he doesn't have any personality out of wanting to touch boobs. But one, he's fifteen, as I said, and two, he just, he's literally had no human relationship, no human like connection with anybody, and he doesn't know how to interact with people, and he doesn't know how to rec like. His whole dream was to live a normal life, and being able to have a girlfriend and to touch a boob is, like, the most normal thing in his brain to think, like, that's, that's normal. That's what normal is. And that, so if you go with that in mind, like, it makes more sense. Uh, as I said, don't, don't judge poor Denji on his, his first 20, his, his self of his first 20 chapters. He's... Yeah, he's been in a bad situation his whole life, and he's still in a bad situation, even now in the manga. And it's seeing the breakdown of the good situation that he was in was not in this volume, so I'm not going to talk about it. But you see that of uh, in both this and Fire Punch, of the characters coming from like really, really bad situations and finding comfort, finding more security, finding somewhere where they feel safe, where it's better, where they can feel like themselves, and then disaster happens, or their own hubris. They they create their own destruction, and they it shows just how broken they are, and how much their trauma and their background has impacted their life, and how from there they can but just because that happens, just because tragedy kind of repeats itself and just because things go turn terrible yet again, it doesn't mean that there's no cause for hope. There, yeah, Fujimoto, despite all of the shock, shocking violence, gore, horrific situations in every, like, human aspect, um, are ultimately very hopeful stories. Um, ultimately very carry a lot of belief that, that there is the light at the end of the tunnel and things can get better and just because the world is terrible and people are terrible and your your whole life shapes your past shapes who you can become it isn't the only thing that determines your worth and it isn't those things aren't the only thing that determine whether or not you're allowed to be happy and that you should be happy and what is like what truly is happiness and who grants that and who who gets to make the decision on other people's unhappiness and it's it's really really good um yeah definitely read this one on um the shown jump app or other like manga plus if you're in a region that isn't covered by the shonen jump app um give it give it a try because it is if you can like survive the first part of it um uh, where it is setting sort of the stage and if you're not put out by the violence and just <laughs> everything in it then uh yeah do do give it a try um i will also say that Fire Punch in its entirety is available if you have the manga, like the Viz Shonen Jump app with a membership. Uh, you can read the entirety of Fire Punch for free on the Viz website reader, um, just because that one is too, too violent for um, for the the app. It doesn't it doesn't fall into uh, the safety or the the restricted protocols of the app store so not allowed to have it on the shonen jump app itself 
similar to like Golden Kamui and some of their other other titles. Uh, Hell's Paradise is another one. So yeah, if you're already on the website to read Hell's Paradise week to week, or uh, or Golden Kamui whenever the new volume comes out, be sure to check out Fire Punch as well, and uh, it it'll save you from like actually having to buy it and then being just like so put off and be like, why did I buy this? You can try it before you buy it. Um, and in, in a legal way, it's it's supporting the publisher, it's supporting the mangaka. And uh, yeah, I mean, I would say that a, most um, English-speaking fans in North America and Australia and the UK should have the jump app if you like if you follow, enjoy shonen manga and you follow it um even if you're not following it week to week but if you're wanting to read practically everything in viz's shonen catalog then and two dollars a month is not a huge commitment <laughs> uh, not a huge cost expense and chainsaw man and fire punch are both quite short they're only 80, 90 ish chapters as of right now. Um, Fire Punch is finished. And Chainsaw Man kind of feels like it's wrapping up. So, not super duper long series either. But yeah, I'm sure most people know of the series or are like wanting to check it out or have been reading it for a long time. So, I don't think I'm necessarily introducing the series to anyone. But if you haven't tried it, <laughs> Uh, or if you don't, hadn't heard of it, um, be sure to give it give it your time. And again, another one that's pretty good for spooky season, um, if you don't mind, like, slasher styles of gore. Um, <laughs> yeah, Chainsaw Man. Check it out. Next, we have the most recent volume of Shoujo Beats, Snow White with the Red Hair by Sorata Akiduki. This is volume 9. And... I have not read this volume yet because brilliant, brilliant planner that I am. Um, I bought this at the comic book store that I was talking about before. I don't have volume 8 yet. <laughs> and that store didn't have volume 8 either. So I just literally haven't read the book before this, so I cannot read this book as of right now. Um, I know. Brains trust over here. Uh, yeah, just, mm-hmm. Great. <laughs> but if you have not read, or if you're not familiar with Snow White with the Red Hair, this is a shoujo set in a kind of, uh, a royalty, uh, setting where our main character, uh, Shiroyuki, has beautiful red hair, vibrant hair, um, so much so that it caught the attention of the prince of her homeland, he wanted to make her uh, basically like his concubine. He wanted to to sequester her in the castle, but she had much higher and uh, more self-respecting goals for herself. She was a herbalist in her hometown and wanted to continue her studies. So she runs away at in the dead of night to escape this prince, runs into the forest, and ends up running into um, another young guy uh, with with his two associates, um, who also turns out who turned out to be another prince, the prince of the neighboring kingdom. Um, and they they quite quickly uh, befriend each other. Uh, they get along quite well, and uh, they very obviously hit it off. Like they're, it's very obvious that they're into each other. Their romance blossoms pretty quickly. But not only does he offer her sanctuary in his home kingdom so she doesn't have to worry about being dragged home to to you know please the the fickle prince of her own kingdom homeland uh she also is offered the opportunity to study and work as a court herbalist at the castle itself um in order so gives her the opportunity to keep doing her 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 life's work, her passion uh, of wanting to help people uh, cure their illnesses and such, but also allows the two lovebirds to to be in close proximity to each other, basically. 
Um, and it's about, you know, Shiryuki and Prince Zen and uh, their the guards, um, Kiki and oh my gosh, I always forget his name, the other guy. And then also Obito, who is sort of her personal guard, um, bodyguard. I love this series. I mean, I, I wax poetic whenever it comes out. This is an ongoing series in Japan. There's 22-ish volumes, um, so we're about halfway through. Not quite, but almost. Um, and I really, well, again, great cast of characters, really wonderful relationship, very respectful and well-balanced relationship in which they support each other's dreams and goals and such things that you'd hope <laughs> were happening in a, a healthy relationship. Um, it also has like a, a decent amount of action and problem solving and various plots, uh, political um, scheming and stuff like that. And Shiryuki is, like, she, she obviously has feelings for the prince, and the prince very obviously has feelings for her, but both of them have their own personal interests, their own personal goals, their own personal things that they enjoy doing, and they support each other on those things. And, ah, uh, it's so wonderful. It is, it's so wonderful. There's now quite a few Shoujo Beat titles that I'm following um, that are just really, really lovely. Um, this and Yen of the Dawn, um, they're very different series, but they're, I think if you enjoy one, you'll enjoy the other. Uh, the third that I'm following, um, well, I'm following more than just three, but the third that I will be talking about, the other one that I'll be talking about, the third that is newish uh, from the last couple of years is very different genre, very different demographic almost, um, and, and, and themings, but Snow White and Yona, I think if you enjoy Yona, you should give Snow White with the Red Hair a shot because it is, it's not overly focused on the romance aspect, it's there, but it's not like the whole what the story is about. Um, all of the characters are very well rounded, similarly to Yona. You have a lot of... Shiriki isn't a princess, but she is involved with some of the things that happen in the... with the royal family, with the courts. Um, and she is obvious... she does have ties, obviously, to to the prince and, and those around him. So, you know... There's, it, and it's more of a European fantasy, I guess, versus the... Uh, well, it's not a fantasy whatsoever. It's more of a European historical setting versus the the eight more Asian influences in Yona. So there, that, there's differences, definitely. They're not nearly the same two, two series, but I think they're... If you enjoyed one, then you will enjoy the other. Uh, but I look forward to reading this one. Just... Once the time, by the time I get volume 8, maybe, <laughs> I'm actually waiting for it. It's one that I ordered online, but again, this particular local comic book store, comic shop, pop culture shop that I bought quite a few of these volumes from, uh, had stuff way, way, way before Australian Street Date, so I just kind of made the mistake and thought that I already had volume 8 but it hasn't been fulfilled <laughs> by where I bought it. So gonna have to gonna have to try and try and find a volume eight sooner rather than later. The next volume is another Shoujo Beat title. This one is volume two of Not Your Idol by Ali Makino. This is another one where I talked about it in my weekly wrap ups videos. Um okay, so I wanna preemptively warn people about this series. It discusses and depicts um, a lot of very perhaps triggering material involving sexual assault, physical assault, rape, violence against women, and societal, societal violence against women. Um, 
rape apologists, victim blaming, just general societal sexism, those, those sorts of things. Um, if those are things that are difficult for you to read, that upset you, that are not um, good for your mental health or your well-being, absolutely you can, you know, you, your, you know your mileage, you can assess whether or not you want to read this series. In saying that, this is one of the best series, full stop, that I've been reading recently. Um, it is a shoujo series. It's Not Your Idol is the English title. It's called Sayonara Miniskirt in uh, Japan. It also talks a lot about um, one of the other larger themes is the toxicity of idol culture and celebrity in society and again like we see it with the the Me Too movement like the dismissal of allegations when it's women for even famous women um, making allegations against people um, in the same level of power or more power or less power like unfortunately women are very often uh, not respected when um, when it comes to a lot of a lot of a lot of issues in society so this follows a high school girl a teenage girl who the year before was working as an idol as part of a group called pure club she was the kind of forefront the main girl the, the lead singer or whatever um, and she loved being an idol. It was sort of her dream. She just loved the idea of being an inspiration and giving people a bit of hope and happiness um, to her fans. Um, and she'd always wanted to be an idol. Uh, unfortunately, at one of the meet and greet events that she attended with the rest of the girls, she was violently attacked with a knife by uh, someone in the crowd or someone who went there. Um, purposefully to attack her and uh, since then she's had a lot of problems with her self-esteem with trauma of the incident and trying to come to terms with um, being okay with herself and and also trying to get back to trusting people especially men um, so she's now she moved no, she cut her hair she completely changed her style she's wears the boys uniform um or at least she wears the pants to her school's uniform she lives in a different city to her mother and stepdad um she so she's completely removed herself from her her um family support which is really sad um in order to stay anonymous her attacker hasn't been caught yet nobody's like ever come forward to that and so she feels very unsafe um and at her school she's very standoffish nobody really likes her she doesn't get along with the guys or the girls and she's very sensitive to um you know a lot of the guys like boys just being boys joking around style of whatever um but one day she she kind of gets closer to and befriends one of the boys in her class called Hikaru who is part of the judo club and uh, he he recognizes that because there's a whole setup where um, like some creepy guy is has been lingering outside the school for a while so the teachers caution girls to go home together um, or have one of the boys take them to school or to and from school uh, to just kind of prevent any attack that may happen as if it's the girl's problem to deal with. Yeah, I feel like the school could have done something more effective than just been like, okay, girls, you, you figure this out yourselves. Um, but anyway, 
<laughs> why do why why do we even expect these sorts of things from institutions? I don't know. Uh, but so he's the only one who kind of recognizes that she is our main character is very um, upset by and scared of this possibility of what's going on, um, and that she she will need or may need you know help getting to and from school. So he says you know he'll walk her. And he he confesses to her that he knows that she's this idol, right? That she's actually this girl um, who'd left this idol group. And but the reason he knows this is because his sister is a huge fan of hers, and not only the group but her specifically. She was her favorite member, and he he feels like he he understands why she's still so traumatized, why she's still so afraid, why she can't trust people, because his sister, uh, the year before or whenever, had been sexually assaulted by her teacher at, in middle school, and uh, it went on for a while. People weren't believing it until ultimately, like, it was found out, and she was bullied out of school, um, and and so, and since then, she hasn't been able to leave her room. Um, she's become a shut-in. And so he's obviously very concerned about his sister, but saying that, like, he understands why it takes a long time for victims to get over things or for to come to terms with things and why it's hard to accept. Or, like, it, it's a huge process to come to terms with what happened to you and then coming to terms with how to change things and, uh, you know, make peace with the situation and heal from trauma. And despite his sister just having, you know, being a shot in and having pretty severe depression since, um, the incident at her own school, this, this idol was like her one happy point, uh, her one hopeful spot, um, and the one thing, uh, the one person to give her hope that things could change for the better. But this particular volume really focuses on some of the other characters, and there is, as I said, like, pretty, you don't see anything, but I will say that there is a rape in this, in this volume, um, and the way that the victim of that deals with that is also very sadly true to life and her her logical reasoning as to how she reacts the way she does and pretending trying to not be a victim but still the psychological impact of things like that this is really 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 well done in the nuance of living within a rape society um or this is this is really really nuanced in understanding living within a rape, rape culture in why society as a whole needs feminism um deconstructing toxic masculinity and the fear of coming to terms with trauma of um facing the, the bad things in society, even if it hasn't personally affected you, why, how the, it does affect other people and how it does affect society as a whole and people's behaviors towards each other and why they need to change. And it's, I said in my wrap up video and in the first volume that I really appreciated that this wasn't a cut and dry issue of like, well, girls, all the girls think that feminism is a good thing and all the boys think that feminism is like a bunch of girls being crazy and just like being unreasonable. That's not the case. Um, there are people of either gender on both sides. There's a lot of like variation in how these people see or how these kids see these issues and why they impact their lives or don't impact don't think they impact their lives 
And also the reality of like playing the game, playing into all of these very to toxic social structures in order to increase your popularity or in increase your social value um, in the eyes of your peers. And it's, it's really, really good. Um, but as I said, it's quite upsetting, especially if you are someone who may be particularly sensitive to these issues, who um, don't have to, you know, don't necessarily want to read about these sorts of things, because the sad thing is, like, this is very reflective of, of true life. And uh, I... I called the first volume like a pretty quint like I don't think I've seen a very such purely feminist manga in a long time. Um but but it it really is. It's it's I think this is an important series for women and young women, especially girls, teenage girls, to be reading. Um, nothing is in your face, but it's reflective of just how insidious and how just completely weaved into our culture a lot of these issues are that that some people just don't even recognize them, don't even see them as a problem. And it's that attitude, that complacency that is most in need of change. So not your idol, hard series to read, not an, not an easy evening, um, uh, you know, read before bed, but I do think it's an important manga. It's one of the best manga coming out right now and it especially best at tackling these issues um and depicting them in how they they look and act in modern day like this feels very very true to life um so yeah if that sounds like your thing check out not your idol it is phenomenal Next is a bit of an oddity. I picked this volume up at a secondhand books sale. Uh, it's an ex-library copy, uh, but this is a series that I've read a little bit of and it is now like currently being released or published in its entirety in digitally. But I found this for a dollar. It was like, why not? I, 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 why not? Um, so this is volume four of The Drops of God by Tadashi Agi and Shu Okimoto. This is sort of a, I mean, kind of like a shonen battle manga. Um, it's, I think it's a seinen in actuality about um, wine tasting, being sommelier. Um, it's about a guy who is told, his father was a famous sommelier um and is told like if you want your inheritance then you have to find the the drops of god which are a, a the the 12 was it the 12 disciples and then the drops of god um which are 12 well 13 different um very expensive luxurious uh high quality amazing just the best of the best wines um in order to, in order to get his inheritance, um, and he he has no interest in wine, but he has a, a perfect palate for wine tasting. So he takes up the offer, and so he is in search of these fantastical, amazing wines, which all actually exist. All of the wines in this are real. Um, if you like wine check the series out, perhaps not in physical publication because we only got four or five volumes of it in print. Um, there's like 34, I think there's 44 volumes in the entirety of the series. So not nearly uh, enough or a, a large amount of the series if you are wanting to read it from beginning to end. I just, I do recommend the digital editions. Um, but Vertical tried. 
they certainly tried. Um, but it's nice that we have gotten this in some capacity. Uh, I like wine. I drink quite a bit of it. Um, so I've, I've known of the series. I've read some of it, the older, like earlier chapters before. Um, but never it, the series in its entirety. I am hoping to actually just sit down and read the volumes soon. Um, but yeah, definitely one to check out. It's a little bit different from, uh, maybe a lot of the food manga, obviously there, I think there's a perceived sophistication when we talk about wine and we talk about sommelier and, and the various types of wine and what makes a wine good. Um, but rest assured, this isn't actually that snooty or anything. Um, it does feel like an act, like a battle action manga, but just with wine as the focus. Um, so if you like that sort of, almost a food war style of, um, you know, competitiveness, check this one out. It's, it may surprise you. Next, we have volume two of... Penguin Drum, the manga by Is the art song by Isuzu Shibata, um, story by Ikuni Chowder, and character design by Lily Hoshino. This is the manga adaptation of the <laughs> Ikuhara anime Penguin Drum or Mawaru Penguin Drum, which is a story of three siblings, two two brothers and a sister. Uh, the sister is uh, suffering from some sort of heart condition, or some sort of physical illness, um, and one day dies, but is mysteriously possessed by the her penguin hat that she got from the aquarium just prior to her collapsing and dying. And uh, the the soul within this penguin hat the princess of the crystal or whatever it is um <laughs> gives tells the brothers that she is granted a additional life for the soul of this body so she, he's she's brought back the sister um resuscitated her um but only if they will help her in um her the ways that she needs and if if only they will assist her and because they are obviously very dedicated to their sister they love her um they agree and thus craziness ensues there's i okay i love this series i love it so 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 much i mean i'm a big um ikuhara fan anyway utana classic amazing uh Yurikuma Arashi is great. Ooh, 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 ooh. It is so good. Um, uh, Sarazanmai is so much fun. So good. So, so good. But Mauro Penguin Drum is... I love it. Like, it is... <laughs> I think only... I, I don't know. I feel like it's it's popular amongst Ikuhara fans, but not necessarily any like people don't really people know Utena. Like Utena has cultural significance in that it's influenced so many people. It was obviously his his first of his works like this, um, and it came out in the nineties. So a lot of people are nostalgic for it, right? But. Uh, Penguin Drum is maybe my favorite of all of Ikuhara's titles, and I don't say that lightly because I love them all. It's probably one for one with U like they're they're do different things better, um, but if you were to ask me like which was my favorite, it would be like pretty much one for one Penguin Drum and Utana. Like I. Mm, Mm -mm 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 -mm. And then the other two would not be far behind, I'm telling you. Um, they're shades of, they're shades of, like, 10 out of 10 in different ways. <laughs> that makes sense. Um, but yeah, I, I love Penguin Drum. I love 
reading it, watching it. Um, I love every iteration of it. I know the anime adaptation had kind of a troubled, or the anime, I should say, had kind of a troubled release in the US at least, um, with dubs and subs and all sorts of things and video quality. But it is so, so, so good and I highly, highly recommend it. Um, I don't know if it's streaming anywhere, and it would be a shame if it's completely out of print. I think Sentai still has the Blu-rays available. I don't know, because I don't own the Sentai Blu-rays. I own the local Blu-rays, the, the Hanabi Blu-rays. Um, but yeah, so we have this mysterious uh, princess within this penguin hat. We also have three the three penguins who uh, kind of become the sidekicks or whatever. They they become assistants to e each of the siblings. We're also introduced to uh, multiple characters uh, or multiple additional characters, including Ringo, who's on the cover here, who is kind of a crazy girl. Uh, she's been stalking her her family friend slash. Uh, a teacher at another school um, for years and trying to she follows this this book here this diary in order to become the future self that she wants to be which I'm not gonna spoil but is very very messed up um, but she does that in order to make her family happy again I think um, yeah <laughs> Ooh. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Uh, Penguin Room is wonderful, and like with a lot of Ikuhara stuff, there's a larger message, there's a lot of symbolism as to what's going on, and all of his titles, whether you read in manga, or watch the anime, or read the novels, there's something new to get from each of the formats, and re-watching or re-reading, you pick up on so many different little things. There's Oh, there's hint. It, if you like like piecing together clues and reading to almost too much into symbolism and what things mean in order to paint a clearer picture, I highly recommend Ikuhara's works. And Penguin Drum is no exception to that. Next, we have another Seven Seas manga. This is volume one of a Yuri title that I've been meaning to pick up for a while. Uh, I've heard very good things about it. And uh, all of the buzz that I heard around it um, seemed very, very positive. It sounded a lot like something I'd be interested in. Um, and this is a three volume series. So whilst I have read this first volume, I may just wait to pick up the last two before I read the entirety of it. But this is Goodbye, My Rose Garden, volume one by Dr. Peppercle. This is a historical a romance, Yuri about a Japanese young young woman who moves to England in order to follow her dreams of being published, uh, being a novelist, and to meet her favorite author. She isn't able to do that, but she does become the maid to a beautiful young woman called Alice. So we have Hanako, who's our main character, the maid, and Alice who is, you know, of high society, has a lot of expectations put upon her, and uh, their friendship, their relationship, perhaps their, um, their romance growing closer, and how society, London society, England's high society and social classes expect people to act, most especially uh, young ladies, ladies of the higher class, and uh, Alice isn't actually that well liked or respected because there are rumors circulating that she is, in fact, a lesbian. And thus, you know, there's something wrong with her. She's bringing shame to her family and this, that, whatever else. So the main, uh, and I think this came as a surprise to a lot of people, it certainly like I don't know, pleasantly surprised me <laughs> because I'm not, like, homophobia is never a good thing, but, like, it it surprised me in a good way that the 
the main thing that these characters have to overcome is the inherent social homophobia of the time period. The This Victorian England setting isn't just table dressing, it is a integral part to the story and how these characters interact within that story and I think that's really nice that that element wasn't just ignored. Again, like I don't think that you need a story about homophobia to be a more like for the villain to be homophobia or whatever to have an enjoyable story especially when we're talking about a queer romance but I, I think it's been a while like it's been a while since I've read a Yuri where homophobia is even an issue <laughs> um or overtly said that it's an issue like there's there's certainly series that recognize that like oh it's unusual for girls to be together or like whatever but it's never like straight up said like oh it's wrong to be a lesbian because this that and whatever else because these are the beliefs of the time um it's it was really good i really liked this first volume um, I said in my wrap-ups video when I talked about this one that I was surprised that, like, I you I wouldn't be surprised if Dr. Pepperco was, and it's it's not. This is like I don't think that this is true, but it, they have they have a very similar aesthetic style and I would say um, interests as Kaoru Mori in maids in Victorian England and they're oh okay the art style is gorgeous like I just it makes me feel like I'm reading I'm reading a Mori book like the art style is different you can tell like it's a different artist but it it reminds me of reading Emma like a lot um but uh, rather than a romance between different social classes it's a romance between different social classes and also women two women so thus homophobia it is, oh, I loved this. I loved it a lot. And uh, I cannot wait to read the rest of it. I I encourage, if you're looking for like a great new Yuri series to try and you like historical romance and you don't mind homophobia being present in your queer fiction, then check out Goodbye My Rose Garden. It's it's short at three volumes. We only have volume one out in English as of right now, but I do um, expect that we'll see the... Uh, is it two or three? It, it's a short series. Regardless, it's not a huge investment compared to some of the other longer uh, Yuri titles we've been seeing as well. Um, but I think three, two or three is like the perfect amount to really un dig deep into this story without extending it too far beyond its reach and dragging it on, on too too long so I do really look forward to reading more when I can and finally for manga we have a single BL that I got uh, this this week and I, again, I got this at my local comic store, so that was a big surprise. Very exciting, because I don't think this will be available. I don't even know if it's out quite yet in the US at all. I don't know. I'm behind. But uh, this is Volume 3 of Given by Natsuki Kizu. I haven't read this one yet, so um, I don't quite know what happens in this particular volume. But damn it, I am so excited and I'm so glad that like I could just have it and take it home and not have to wait two weeks for it to ship out to me. Um, I mean, this is, huh, okay, so this is the uh, BL, obviously. it's It focuses on a couple different characters. Our main couple is a pair of high school boys. Um, who are now both in, well, one has a very personal attachment to uh, an electric guitar, but was never uh, personally the one to play it, um, and it had been 
uh, the strings broken and stuff. And so he he the other boy in this in this main couple uh, ran into him uh, in in his sleeping spot <laughs> in the back of the gym, sees the guitar, and uh, tells him like, "Oh, that's a cool guitar." Um, why don't you fix the strings? And he's like, oh, you can fix the strings. They said, yep. So they kind of, he kind of gets like uh, caught up in this this quiet guy from another class who he'd never really met before. Um, and he starts teaching him how to play guitar. He later invites him to join the band that he has with our other two main characters who are university students uh, who play the bass guitar and the drums, uh, respect, respectively, um, and, uh, it's, it's super duper good. <laughs> um, it has a film coming up, uh, next year. The, it has an anime adaptation, which you can watch right now. It's streaming everywhere that where you can legally stream anime, uh, Crunchyroll, uh, and, and stuff. I think it's been licensed by... Sentai? I don't remember who licensed the series. Um, but it's it's well worth the, the watch. It's it's one of those BL titles that people like to say is like, well, if you're not a fan of BL, like you can still watch it and enjoy it. Um, it or like it doesn't have any of the toxicity of what people think of like BL tropes. Um, which is kind of unfair because BL is such a huge genre and demographic so it's well no it's not a genre it's such a huge demographic and I think a lot of people still th see like the worst of the mid 90s <laughs> stuff as like what is what it is and that's obviously not the case we know this um but if you are someone like who doesn't regularly read BL um if you're just someone who who likes queer fiction or who likes music, music fiction, I would recommend it. There's, there's drama. There's a lot of relationship drama, especially when it comes to the adult characters or the, the university student characters. But the high school re relationship, I mean, there's drama there as well. But, like, it's, it's all actual human relationship drama that like actually happens in real life and none of that really toxic toxic stuff that do would would have happened in like 1995 um when reading BL but anyway great series great music as well which is another reason to watch the anime and characters are all very empathetic you really feel for them and their situations and you really want them to succeed um, not only in their their interpersonal relationships and their romances but just in the, being them and in growing up and finding themselves and becoming more strong um, to who they are and healing and connecting through music and it's just it's beautiful I look forward to reading this one I don't know why I put it off I've kind of had a slack reading week this week um, unfortunately but Given is wonderful. Um, it is one of my favorite BL coming out right now. Uh, it's just all around great at what it does and it definitely deserves its popularity and its accolades. Um, I think there are six volumes currently in Japan so we are halfway through uh, what is available but these are slow releases like most Sublime books it, it takes a while um to get books <laughs> from them not because they're slack or lazy or anything it's just BL in general has a pretty slow publishing schedule so you don't want to catch up too quickly uh, and then be waiting for years until the next volume which has happened um but yeah so given is really really good and really happy that I was able to get this third volume and not have to worry about like shipping and having to wait for the post and all these all these other things and finally for this month I picked up a light novel again from their local comic shop so they do also have light novels which was a really exciting thing to discover and this is 
the first novel in the Penguin Drum novelization. So I was able to get both the manga and the novel this month. Uh, again, I haven't read this one, um, but I mean, I, I expect that it's a pretty close rendition of the original anime series. I don't think there'd be too many changes. Uh, ne typically between adaptations you just get like small changes, a little more expanding on on certain events. Uh, you may be within characters' heads, uh, so you see from their perspective versus from an omniscient narrator or viewer's perspective, which I don't know if that's the case here because I haven't even like opened it up to look. Uh, but this is, uh, aside from Ikuhara's influence, was written by Kei Takahashi and uh, yeah, basically follows the same events uh, as what I said in <laughs> with the manga. Um, this was put out by Seven Seas as part of their light novel um, line. I don't own a lot of Seven Seas light novels. Not for uh, honestly, I, I can't even just really remember what they put out. <laughs> Not for lack of interest or lack of like titles. I'm sure they have a lot of really interesting, cool stuff. And I may own some of their titles, but nothing immediately jumps out to me as a book of theirs that I own as of right now. Oh, um, Paranoia Agent. Paranoia Agent? What am I talking about? Perfect Blue. Perfect Blue. I own those novels, and I think those are Seven Seas uh, novels. Um, but normally the light novels that I buy are from Yen Press or J Novel Club nowadays. Um, but again, I, if, I mean, I'm happy. Whoever licenses what, if I want it, I'm gonna buy it. <laughs> like, <laughs> it doesn't matter. I don't, I have no loyalty to any particular publisher. We know this. Um, so yeah, I am hoping to read this sooner rather than later. I'd be interested to see like where on the timeline this one ends, um, or the events of the the show or the series it ends, because I know there's, I think it's an ongoing novelization. Um, he has the manga's five volumes, so I think the novels are three volumes. I don't know. I can't remember. Uh, but I've been wanting to get this for ages, and it just kind of, like, slipped priority-wise down, um, month after month after month, and so the fact that I was able to get it at this local comic store was really great. I was really excited and happy, and again, super, super willing to pay for the convenience of just, like, having it there and taking it home. So I don't mind, I don't mind the extra costs that comes with supporting a local family-run business versus buying online. Uh, but yeah, Penguin Drum. <laughs> I hope to read it soon. So that was everything that I got for this month of October when it comes to manga and light novels. Quite a bit more than I expected, especially considering I didn't pre-order much, if anything, uh, this month. And I really lucked out in finally checking out that local comic store because they did have so many things that I was wanting that I was excited for um, but I hadn't just gotten via other means and I hopefully will be able to continue to support them in the future on a regular basis. But let me know your thoughts and feelings on any of these titles. Do you love them? Hate them? Hadn't heard of them? Did you start Chainsaw Man or um, Soul Leader or even not your idol recently? Have you been following any of these titles? Did you finish any titles this month? I love reading your comments and I do try to read and respond to every single one of them. Um, if you enjoyed it, consider uh, liking the video, but you know, no obligation if you don't want to. And of course, if you enjoy this, uh, this content, then you, I, you could subscribe. I feel like half of my audience isn't actually subscribed to me, which is, I mean, maybe fair. <laughs> but if you are wanting to to regularly follow my videos, um, the clicking the subscription button will will certainly help with that. 
Um, in the description box below, as always, I have my Twitter, uh, link to my Twitter, I'm on there quite often. Um, and, uh, recently I have posted the most recent episode of the Read Right to Left podcast, that's the podcast I co-host with my good friend Ray from Whimsical Pictures, where we talk about manga of all sorts, styles, lengths, and genres. This month we talked about uh, horror manga for spooky season, so lots of great titles in that discussion, maybe some things that uh, you hadn't heard of or uh, maybe want to be checking out, especially considering there is a Kodansha Humble Bundle horror manga deal going on right now. <laughs> um, so jump on that if you want to, um, or if you can. Um, otherwise, yeah, uh, I also, tomorrow night, which will be Saturday, the 31st of October, so Halloween, um, it'll be 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, you US time, um, which is 10, 10 p.m. for me. Uh, but I will be doing my now weekly live stream wrap up where I talk about all of the different manga that I've read and novels and other things, comics, uh, books, whatever else uh, that I've read for this week. And this this week I'm doing so in costume because it is Halloween, and so we got to celebrate whilst uh, the world should it should be uh still in lockdown and everyone's social distancing we can hang out together on stream <laughs> rather than going out and trick-or-treating uh but yeah so if that's something that interests you um be sure to pop in th in those times and uh catch me there we we have a good time we hang out and we have a good time people like to see me have mental breakdowns over clamp manga but Matt's neither here nor there. <laughs> um, but yeah, so thank you guys so, so much for watching. I will catch you in the next video. Bye till then.